you heard about the five stages of grief and how you have to go through each one of them to get closure, yeah? There's no five stages of grief. There never was. And there's no closure when we're talking about grief. Because death ends a life, not a relationship. If someone mattered to you in life, they continue to matter to you after they die. We just have to find a different way to relate to them. And given that grief impacts all of us, it's extraordinary how many misperceptions there are out there about it. You might have heard some of these. It takes a year to get over grief because you have to go through all the firsts. Or some deaths are so difficult you'd never get over them. You wouldn't be expected to. Or sure isn't all grief complicated in its own way and we shouldn't go around labeling it. Well, let's have a look at some of them. When we talk about getting over grief, I think we're talking actually about having the flu. So if you look at that slide and look at the jar on the left, if we're the jar, can you remember the last time you had the flu and you are just full of flu symptoms? You can't think straight, you're just walking flu. You wake up one day and it's the worst day of the flu, but then the chances are the next day the symptoms are going to lessen and lessen and the flu symptoms recede. And if we had more balls and jars in a progression, why at some time you couldn't see the symptoms at all and you'd go back to being your old self again. You, you, you come back into the fullness of your health. That's a grand model for when we're talking about flu, but it does not work for grief. Grief changes us. It transforms us. It changes us forever. And you know what? It's actually a bereaved person's worst nightmare that they would ever forget that person or that person would become invisible. So let's let go of the idea of getting over grief. It doesn't happen. Here's a better way to think about grief. Start with the same ball on the left-hand side, but let's call it grief now. And let's say that we are the jar. So this is like acute grief. When you first hear that someone has died or when you witness a death, we go into shock. Because death is always shocking. It's not always surprising, sometimes it's expected, but it's always a shock. We're destabilized. We can't take it in. But look what happens in this progression. It's not the grief, the ball, that's changing. It's us, the jar changes. This is actually how grief works. It's an instinctual healing process. We grow around grief. We become bigger. Nearly everybody experiences that acute grief reaction. But as they move on their grief journey, they again add back into their lives the things that matter. Their job, their friends, their family, their hobbies, their hopes, and their dreams. That's how we're hardwired in grief. That is how it goes. Grief is messy. Yes, we experience emotions such as depression and anger, but only as part of a myriad of other emotions. We're as likely to experience guilt, remorse, bitterness, relief, sadness. Heck, we could feel them all on the same day. That's grief for you. And grief certainly doesn't occur in any linear way. We don't step through our grief in that way of having the flu. It's more like a figure of eight. People have good days and bad days. You can wake up one day and think, you know, today isn't too bad. I can get through today 
or I actually caught myself smiling or engaging with someone or not thinking about the person that died for a moment, only to wake up the next day and be catapulted right back into your grief, be ambushed by your grief simply by hearing a song on the radio that reminds you of that person. So while everybody's grief is different, there are those commonalities in grief. We move forward in our grief. The trajectory is forward, albeit two steps forward, one step back. But it moves. That's how we're hardwired. So a reasonable metaphor is to think of grief like a train journey. We all get on the train, but we stop at different stations for different amounts of time. The difference with the grief journey is there is no end point. There's no closure, you don't get over it, but you accommodate to it. That's how we're made as human beings. And I wanted to talk to you just a moment about why we grieve. It seems pretty obvious to say we grieve, we feel bereft when we've lost something that matters to us. And indeed, we are hardwired to attach to people. As infants, our very survival depends on it. But long after we don't need that physical care anymore, we continue to seek out and attach to people in our lives. Most healthy adults have about five attachment figures in their life. I'll pause for a moment so you can <laughs> count. <laughs> they're the people, if something big happened in your life today, they're the people you would want to tell, be it a good thing or a bad thing. They're the people that calm us, support us. We seek them out in life. If they're our children, we grow them. They're the people that matter to us. They take care of us. And we want to take care of them. But here's something new that we know about attachment figures. They actually have a regulatory function in our lives. We like to be in proximity to them, but we actually function better when we're around them. We're our best selves. We know this. We function better psychologically, physiologically, and physically. So, of course, we're going to protest when they're gone from our lives. And my goodness, isn't it a difficult adaptation when we realize they're gone for good? That's the course of grief. It asks of us to find a way to still be in contact with those people, but to accept that they're no longer in this world. And I think that begs the question, if we, are, if we are so attached to these people, how do we ever come to terms with grief? Well, it's interesting. You know, we have a physical immune system, and it can be strong or weak, or it can be compromised at times, but it keeps us well in our bodies. And so, let's say we fracture our arm. We put a cast on it, to hold it in place, to support it. But the cast doesn't heal the arm. The body heals the arm. Yeah? Same thing if our heart is fractured. We have a parallel psychological immune system. And if we listen carefully to bereaved people within the first six months after a death, you'll hear this immune system, we call it resilience, at work. Bereaved people will say things like, I miss him terribly, but at least he didn't suffer. Or at least we could bring her home. Or God needed another angel in heaven. We find a narrative that eases our pain, that helps us accommodate to our grief. And that's how it moves. We have our up days and our down days in grief. What do bereaved people need from us? They need us to show up in our common humanity, to accompany them, to support them, and maybe to bring some food. And we, in turn, hope that when we are bereaved, that somebody will show up for us. 
and do the same. But what I really want to talk to you about today is the people that that doesn't work for. The people that are frozen in their grief. When grief doesn't move in any way, when it becomes frozen, we describe that as complicated grief, or it's sometimes called persistent complex grief. And I would like you to know that that's a thing. It's not a made up thing. Complicated grief is a thing. We're not talking about the difficulties that every death brings. Of course, every life story has its difficulties. I'm talking here about a very specific complicated grief reaction that falls outside of the, the cultural and religious norms of that person. Not everybody is on the same page with this. Not everybody agrees that we should diagnose grief. I can tell you bereaved people are well aware, if they're stuck in their grief, that people say things about them like, they're not trying hard enough, or maybe they're milking it a bit, or maybe they're enjoying the attention. Truly, nobody would want to feel the way you feel when your grief is stuck. If we went back to the first example of the ball in the jar, that acute grief, that first stage of grief, this is what complicated grief feels like. It becomes chronic. Some of the hallmarks of it are relentless yearning for the person that's died, persistent and intrusive thoughts about the person, pangs of guilt, a belief that you could have somehow prevented this death, an inability to engage in life in a productive way. No sense that life could ever hold any joyful moments again. What a way to live. We see people, 5, 10, 20 plus years after a death, who are living these lives of quiet desperation, frozen in time, as if their life ended the day that person died. That's no way to live. We see people who haven't left their houses in years, or who only leave their house to go to work and come home and go to bed and lie awake and berate themselves around why they didn't make that person go to the doctor sooner. We see people with no joy in their life. People who don't listen to music because the memories are too painful, who can't go to the beach because of the connection to that person. And I really want people to know that it can be better than that. We don't have to hold on so tightly to our attachment figures after they die because we know that we have a chemical connection to them. We can't unconnect or disconnect from them. That connection is there whether they're alive or not. We just have to think of them to feel that calming influence. Of course we'd prefer they were here we get it, it's not an option anymore. But the good news is that we now have some ideas about how to treat complicated grief. As I said, not everyone's on board with this, but I am not talking about diagnosing grief willy-nilly. That would be ridiculous. Most people find their own way through grief. We're probably talking about 10% of bereaved people. It's a significant minority. Do you know this person? Do you recognize yourself perhaps in some of those symptoms? If you do, I would like you to know it can be better. New protocols have been developed. Columbia University in New York has led out on this, but there's also new protocols from Australia and from a couple of European sites and we have been training therapists in how to treat complicated grief. Because we now know from the trials that have been done that we need to work in a different way with these people. Supportive counselling isn't enough. That's a bit like the cast. It provides support and that's lovely, but it doesn't seem to be enough to get the grief back on track. With our train metaphor, it's like the train is derailed. 
So it's not a matter of the bereaved person needing to try harder. We have to get the train back on track. If we go back to the fractured arm idea, if you met that person, you'd say something to them like, take it easy now until your arm heals, yeah? If they showed you your arm and you saw this, I think you'd be saying, you really should go see someone about that. That's only going to get worse. And you'd be right. And that analogy holds true for the fractured heart. When you're caught in grief, when your grief is stuck, you need specialist intervention. We know how to treat it. If you're aware of somebody who perhaps has complicated grief, please encourage them to go get some help. There's no need to live out your life in quiet desperation. It's really no tribute to somebody that's died to have us living a life of misery. Isn't the real tribute to someone that dies for us to live well? And finally, no matter where you stand on the idea of diagnoses in general, I think the only reason we should ever diagnose anything is if it helps to heal suffering. And in the case of grief, that's a good thing. <coughs> because we are the bereaved. Thank you. <laughs>